here this evening. So I just wanted to do a quick introduction of folks because some of these are new faces, the first time that you have met some of these folks. So you all know Amy, I think, Amy Moore Thomas. Um, she's just back from maternity leave, so she's been off all summer, but we just got her back earlier this month, no, last month. Yeah. So we're super happy to have, have Amy back. Um, I think most of you know Laurel. She's our watershed education coordinator. So she's busily booking fourth grade watershed programs um, for the, the upcoming school year. Um, some of you have met Ellen. She was at our last meeting last year. So Ellen is our community, our outreach and fundraising person. There you go. That's her title. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen, for filling in my blank. Yeah. My blank. Um, and if anybody's interested in the auction or donating items to the auction or learning more about the auction, Ellen is your person and she does need to skedaddle because she's got some, she's got a distance to go. So you can also talk to me before yeah. the end of the evening. And then our newest team member is Sonia. This is Sonia Melander. <laughs> so Sonia is our newest member, as I said. She's our Associate Director of Education. And so she's really heading up the entire education department um, and it's just hit the ground running. So um, Krista Hawley used to be the one here at these meetings um, as her, our adult program person. When Krista left, um, it kind of opened up an opportunity for us to reorganize a little bit. And uh, Sonia has come to us and has just been a fantastic addition. So it's a great team and we're very happy um, to have all of you here. Casey had to leave a little bit early, but Casey Walters was here earlier as well. Um, so but she's sorry that she needed to leave a little bit early. Um, just a couple of things. Um, I'm going to turn this over here to Sonia, but I just again wanted to thank everyone for being here tonight. And um, I'm going to let her introduce Maria, but Sonia wanted to give everybody a little heads up of what's coming up in PBAS. Come on up, Sonia. So hello, hello everybody. Hi, good to meet everybody. Um, okay, yep, so I am Sonia. Not only do I wanna tell you what's coming up, but we've had a pretty exciting last week. And so I wanna tell you a little bit about what's been going on this week and then looking ahead into the future, all these exciting things that you can be involved with. Uh, so this past weekend, we had um, one of our native plant and bird seed sales, uh, but it wasn't just a sale, it was also, a native plant talk done by that guy back in the room. <laughs> Bob, thank you, Bob. Yeah, there was a great turnout for that. 45 people, I think, came to, to learn about plants and then get plants and put plants out in nature in their yards and doing all that good stuff. That was last Saturday. Uh, then Monday, we hit the ground running. Laurel led a monarch tagging program uh, for 20-ish People um, didn't actually catch any monarchs, but we sure had a fun time and learned a lot about the monarchs that we have um, there at Cool Springs Preserve. Uh, we did outdoor school this week. So right now it's the start of the school season. Um, so we have programs for public schools and homeschoolers and some youth that aren't old enough for school yet. Um, and so this is our outdoor school program. and. Amy's been doing some really cool things just based off of whatever is around in nature. So right there, they are gathering some goldenrod and dyeing some fibers with the goldenrod that is just spectacular at Cool Springs. Now, did you, the, the monarch, mm -hmm. did, did you say that you didn't catch any monarchs? We did not, yeah. Did you see any monarchs? We did see, yeah. There was one that came right at the beginning to say hi. <laughs> And then it left. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. We have been seeing caterpillars as well on the swamp milkweed in particular. It seems to be their favorite. And then yesterday was a really big, exciting day. And I know some people in this room were a part of that. And thank you so much. So yesterday was the United Way Day of Caring. And I think 17 volunteers came out um, in addition to the people that spent their time cooking delicious food for us that fueled all of these bodies that did wonderful things um, for the cottage there at Cool Springs Preserve. So we're so grateful for all that volunteer support getting things done. Okay, looking ahead, uh, next two weeks. Uh, so, well, starting tomorrow, Laurel, Busy Bee, 
is going to be leading a pawpaw forest foraging workshop at Yang Tower. And there's still some spots left. Um, so you should all know that Laurel has been working on the pawpaw bread and figuring that out to be super delicious and spice mush latte. So that's something to look forward to if you can make that. Again, there's still spots. This weekend, we have nature journaling at Stoffer's March. So that should be a lovely day. Um, hope somebody, hope some folks here can make it out for that. As I mentioned, Amy uh, is doing a ton of education with our We Naturalists and Outdoor School. So that's various days um, starting last week and going through the school year. So if you think anybody might be interested in that, check that out. I mentioned the goldenrod. So one of the wellness walks that's coming up next week is definitely gonna have some really good time appreciating the goldenrod that's so beautiful now and well be, will be um, next week. So this is the wellness walk at Cool Springs Preserve that's coming up. So if you want a brisk walk uh, to get your heart going, not that, not that brisk, but you know, it's a wellness walk. If you wanna take it more slow style, um, on the morning, the next morning, the morning of the 20th, there's going to be a bird walk at Cool Spring Preserve. So lots going on at Cool Spring, not just the morning of the 20th, but the evening of the 20th. There's more stuff going on. So when it gets dark, we'll do an insect and spider safari there at Cool Spring Preserve. And that's um, many of these, as you probably know, are led by volunteers and we're so grateful to their support. And another one that is coming up next week um, that people can join from wherever is Kingfisher Kahoot. So this is an online trivia night that is super, super fun. This this month's theme is arachnophilia, favorite spiders, ticks, and mites. So if you want to come and have some appreciation for and learn about these creepy and wonderful creatures, please join us. There's still some spots on this one as well. The last thing I'll tell you about is not in the next two weeks, but I did want to tell you about the next monthly program, which is um, going to be by Kevin Oxenrider. So that's the state herpetologist, the amphibian and reptile program leader with the West Virginia Department of Natural Resources. And so he's going to be talking about box turtles and box turtle conversation, not conversation, but conservation here in West Virginia. So that is what we have coming up. But we have tonight, and we have a great thing happening tonight because we have Maurice, Maria Parisi here. Um, and I'm very honored to be able to introduce her to you. So Maria Parisi is a Potomac Valley natural, Master Naturalist and a Potomac Valley Audubon Society member who works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. As the partnership team lead, she co-manages the History, Library, and Partnerships branch, where she also edits the Services Conservation History Journal. After working on a journal issue with a feature essay on the history of conservation in the United States, which told the story of a few white men we credit for legislation that informs conservation today, she turned to explore women in conservation history in and beyond the service. In her free time, Maria can often be found in her garden, in her garden planting natives and improving habitat for wildlife. Okay, and about the presentation tonight, which you may have read, but it's such a good description, and I'm really excited to read it out loud. So about tonight, let's travel back in time to visit with women in conservation history, with naturalists, scientists, adventurers, and advocates. How did a couple of cousins hosting tea parties in Boston play a role in stopping the slaughter of birds for fashion? What did a New York socialite and suffragist turned conservationist born in 1877 do that helped Rachel Carson launch the modern environmental movement? What did a woman who spent her honeymoon traveling 500 miles in Alaska by boat and dog sled while her husband conducted caribou research have to do with the passage of the wilderness Act? Act. These and other extraordinary women, famous or forgotten, shaped environmental history. Come learn their stories. We did. We're gonna. I'm excited. Join me in welcoming and thanking Maria.
And thank you, Sonia and Laurel, for all the technology stuff you do to make this happen. So let me get this hooked up. How's that? How's that in the back? Hello, hello? Did I turn it off? No. I'll try it. How about now? Okay. <laughs> I don't think it was on. Okay. All right. I have a fancy mouse. Do. So thank you all for coming. I'm really excited that you're here. Um, I think this is a really fun topic. Um, and so we're just going to dive right in because I see it's quarter after and I've got a lot of other stories I want to share with you. So um, I practiced this before. <laughs> we practiced before. <laughs> it's not doing anything. Okay. So um, I just want to, you heard a little bit about the fact that I'm editing a journal. So I just want, oh, hi, Georgia, <laughs> you snuck in. Um, I just want to just share that so much of what I'm going to cover tonight uh, is, is thanks to so many people, uh, people who wrote about these women that we're going to talk about in the journal, as well as some of the artwork and things that you're going to see um, that just, just know that there's a whole crew of folks who are part of this effort. Um, we'll talk about a little bit, touch on the history of conservation, then we'll get into the her stories of conservation. And if you want to play at the end, I have a little quiz. I really do have a quiz. <laughs> and then we want to make sure we have time for questions. So I'm going to do this in three parts. Um, talk about, um, well, I'll just get into it with three parts. So basically, this is just a quick slide to show you that um, the article that was written in the journal prior to the one on the women in conservation history, um, these were just a few of the men that were mentioned, all white men. And I thought, OK, what else? Whose stories are we missing? So then we start the women's issue. Um, I borrowed this quote, I love this quote. Um, so you get a look at that. For most of history, Anonymous was a woman. There's just so many times women are behind the scenes and maybe haven't been recognized for their work and their efforts. Um, so first woman, who here is maybe, is anybody here especially familiar with the art of taxidermy? We do have a couple folks. Okay. Um, and has anybody seen, uh, you all sometimes go to the, uh, the American Conservation Film Festival. Have any of you seen the movie Stuff? film stuff that was in 2021. You did, a couple of people over here. So if you haven't and you're intrigued, it really does show the, what it, why is it an art? Um, it really is, is kind of a fun, and that's online, you can watch the film. All right, the first woman I'm gonna talk about, a uh, very particular title, women's work. She was uh, nicknamed the Colorado Huntress. So this is Martha Dart Maxwell. Has anybody here ever heard of Martha Dart Maxwell before? Okay, good. All right. She's my only maybe surprise tonight. Um, so I'll go through her early years. She was born, we'll travel back. She was born Martha and Dart in Pennsylvania in 1831. Her father died of scarlet fever when she was only a couple years old. And her mother was so grieving and, and distraught that she basically ended up for a little while being raised by her grandmother, Abigail. And this is really important because Abigail is a very independent woman and she takes her out for walks in the woods. And Martha really just cultivates this love of nature and being outside and being with animals. So she's an important character in her life. Um, the mother, Amy, does remarry this Joshua. He also supports her interest in nature and, and really supports that in her life. Martha's about nine when that happens. And then she has two stepsisters, Mary and Elizabeth. And I mentioned them, Mary's important a couple of different ways. They were alone in the cabin one day when Mary was a toddler and there's a rattlesnake. And so Martha grabs her dad's gun, which she's never used before, and shoots the rattlesnake and saves her sister. So her father comes in and decides that he's going to teach her how to use that gun. And she becomes a really good shot. So um, that started with Mary. Um, she goes to Oberlin College for a year, but her family really doesn't have a lot of uh, financial means and she can't finish out past a year. So there's this wealthy guy in town named James Maxwell, and he's a widower, and he's got six kids. And the two oldest ones, he wants to send to Lawrence College, but he wants to pay her to chaperone. And if she'll do that, he'll pay her tuition. So she's going to do that. She's going to go finish her degree. So along the way, James also asks her to get married. He's 20 years older. She thinks about this a little bit. Um, but she does, and they get married in 19, I mean, in 1854. They do have a daughter, um, Mabel, but the year Mabel's born is the panic of 1857, the financial panic, 
And even though he was quite wealthy and had a number of businesses, he lost all that. And they were just financial ruin. That's it. So this was also timed with the gold rush and people heading west. So they decide to head out. Am I blocking the screen for anybody? Okay. Um, they decide to hit Colorado and go after the gold rush. They leave Mabel behind um, and they go out and they do this. <laughs> um, in fact, James didn't want her to come and she's like, I'm coming. So um, they're both entrepreneurs over their lives. Uh, they're both always starting up new businesses and then they're struggling financially all the time. So one of the things that, that the gold mining wasn't really working out too well financially. So one of the things that she did is she ended up running, op building and operating a boarding house. And she would also do wash and, and do some mending and, and she earned some money. She ended up being able to buy some land mines, uh, claims and a cottage on some land. And what happened was the boarding house burned. So now they lose both their home and her sense of income. So she has a cottage on a, on a cabin on one of these properties that she bought. So they go there, they go to the cabin and they're getting settled, but they, they depart for some reason. I can't remember. And when they come back, there's this taxidermist. There's this man in there occupying the cabin and he won't leave. So they camp out in a nearby cabin for a couple of weeks until he leaves. Then she comes with her tools and takes the door frame off and gets in there and discovers all this taxidermy, all these specimens inside. And she is enthralled. She's fascinated. So as she's clearing out the cabin, she's studying these. And then she writes home and says, I want a book. Somebody, I need a book. I need to learn how to do this. So um, that's what she does. She starts learning how to do taxidermy. Um, her mother's ill. She goes back to Wisconsin. But while she's there, she stays and she finds somebody to study under to learn taxidermy. And along the way, she's improving her natural history skills. Um, she didn't like her early work, so she changes it. She invents a new technique. So at the time, taxidermy was still done mostly by stuffing skins with straw. So you can imagine they'd be kind of bloated looking. They didn't really necessarily look like the animal very much. And she would study the musculature and she would try to figure this out. So since she didn't like the early work, she, she created this frame and used plaster and then would cover the skin over the plaster. And nobody had really done this before. And then her other thing right from the beginning was to, to put her specimens in a natural setting. She wanted you to see the habitat. She wanted these lifelike, realistic looking animals um, so you could see. So she ends up going back to Colorado. Um, and she starts collecting and she goes on these expeditions. Um, first, she pays some, um, I think, some teenage boys to collect for her. But then she wants more of a say in what she wants. And so she starts doing it herself. And sometimes she goes alone. Sometimes she, she brings Mabel back this time. Sometimes she goes with Mabel. And sometimes she goes with James or some other adventures. She has adventures. She gets stuck in storms. She falls down hills. They get lost for a while. Um, she runs into Buffalo and shoots Buffalo and takes the skin. She um, has one instance where um, there's an eagle and she sees the nest and she wants the eggs. And James isn't tall enough. So she climbs on James's shoulder and climbs up before that hawk comes back <laughs> to defend her nest. So she's quite the woman. I mean, she's quite the adventurer. Um, in, in very little time, she's got a hundred specimens and she's asked to show her work at this, um, this local, this state expo. Um, as soon as she does that, she sells her collection for $600 and starts all over. And she very quickly ends up with 600 more specimens. Why did she start a well, she sold her collection, so now she needed to go start collecting new. Why did she sell her? She's always financially strapped. Oh. She's always needing to find some other way of income. You're going to see that through this. Um, so that was a chance to get some money and then start over. And she would sell individuals. She would commission, you know, prod, you know, some animals, folks. Um, did I advance too quickly? Let's see. Okay, so this is about, this is her daughter commenting on... Um, how Martha behaved, that she became such a good naturalist. She just studied. She would go out in the wild and she would just sit there for hours and watch animals, watch how they moved, watch how they interacted with other animals. And this all informed how she puts them together in a habitat. Um, so another way to make money, she decides to take all these specimens because it because she fills them up in her house. The house gets really full. <laughs> She's always adding animals. Um, so she opens up for money 
um, a museum in Boulder charges 25 cents. She's got buffalo, bear, lion, birds. And then she's got one display of monkeys around a table playing poker just for amusement. And then she's also got live animals. So she'll have rattlesnakes and um, different animals. She's trying to get you interested. Um, that's not financially successful. So she moves the, to Denver, hoping she's going to do better there. Um, in this time, she's corresponding with the top ornithologists and naturalists of the day. She's sending specimens. She's getting resources in return. She's really learning more about different species. Um, she ends up taking an owl that was outside her house and sending it in and discovers that she's um, Smithsonian Institution says, you have discovered a new subspecies, the Rocky Mountain um, Screech Owl. So they named it after her. So the end of the name has her last name in it. Um, and then she also confirms for Western science, um, John James Audubon had said he had seen this animal, this black-footed ferret, but Western science hadn't seen it. So until she had three in her collection, she could she was the first to say, yes, this is a real animal for, for the Western scientists. Um, she has become quite known locally. The state is impressed and they ask her to represent the state at the 1876 Centennial Expo, the International Expo. It runs for six months, gets 10 million visitors. Um, and she has created this diorama uh, that has 434 birds, 48 mammals, and she's brought black-footed ferrets along with her. Um, the display itself has uh, mountains, running water in a cave. And she has set animals at the relative elevation uh, of where they belong in this display. And um, folks are just bowled over. She's five feet tall. She's got this outfit on that she uses when she goes you know, out on her expeditions, which, you know, with bloomers and she wasn't dressed for the day, right? So um, she and her stepsister, Mary Dart, the one that she saved from the rattlesnake, um, she helps her staff this exhibit at times um, they're bombarded with questions. Did a woman do this? Did you shoot these animals? How did you do that? They're, they're incredulous. They cannot believe a woman did this. Um, and then they you know, ask a lot of questions about how it's done. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of a picture. Um, how does that show up behind me? Um, I'm not sure where the picture on the left is taken. It wasn't documented for me. It may have been in her museum. But I've also was reading that she does this in her home. She'd set up branches and trees and put animals and squirrels and chipmunks and stuff. She would do this inside her home. So I suspect this is uh, the left side is the museum. The right, you are seeing a portion of the exhibit, which was, she was in a building. The whole building was the Kansas, Colorado Expo. And there's more to the right and there's more to the left. If you can tell, it's a little hard. I know the lighting, these old pictures is not very clear. There's a mountain lion up in the top right corner going after um, creatures. There's, you see her standing at the beginning of the, at the entrance of the cave. Um, you just don't get a sense that well, but you can just, if you just imagine for a moment how big a space this was and that she shipped all this stuff to Philadelphia and she's showcasing this and people are just bowled over. She is just, she becomes, this is her 15 minutes of fame. She's becoming well-known. Um, uh, I'm going to leave this for anybody who maybe wants to come back and look at these links um, to pull up some more photos. Um, it's really, uh, I can't do it justice with this. Um, she also would be questioned, you know, you killed all these animals yourself. She was actually a lifelong vegetarian. And other than her expeditions, her defense was, I'm killing animals to preserve them. You're killing them to eat them. <laughs> so you know, she was trying to say that she kind of had the, the moral upper hand in that she was preserving this for perpetuity. And so she was doing a service. And if you think about it at the time, we didn't have internet, we didn't have, you know, if you weren't traveling, you didn't know what these animals were and that's what they did. They would collect specimens and show you. So she was she was educating a lot of people about what wildlife and habitat was at in Colorado. Um, so a little bit about her expo experience. The Colorado legislature said, we'll pay for you to ship everything out and you can take photos and sell pictures of yourself. Well, the official photo company didn't allow that. She ended up living in that cave for part of that time because she didn't have the means to live. And she and her husband are estranged over time and that's not working out. So she's she's actually spending some time here. Um, she, she tries a few more things. She tries to sell her... Um, 
collection in DC and she, she does a number of things. She's really moved around it quite a bit. Um, but ultimately she, she actually becomes, um, she's not with her family anymore and she becomes lonely and she becomes ill and she dies um, of cancer. Mabel is with her when she passes. Um, and then Mabel makes attempts to save her collection. They try to sell it. Um, they've done a couple of things, but the people who had it in their possession did not take care of it and they deteriorated. So there's almost nothing left of her, of her collection. I understand there's a couple of pieces in the Smithsonian. Um, and the reason I wrote Forgotten While We Remember Others, she influenced other taxidermists of the day who one of them is named Carl, and I forget if the name is pronounced Ackley, who's considered the father of taxidermy. It's kind of like, she was teaching that. <laughs> but we don't remember her. So this book actually, um, her half-sister Mary Dart wrote this with her after the expo as another effort to make some money and, and get some finance financial support. And really is uh, very much first hand accounts of you know these ventures and her ex, you know, how things went with her family and and um she has now been recognized in the Colorado Hall of Fame. So um, people have been kind of finding her again. So yeah, she's the first naturalist, female naturalist to collect her own specimens. She's invented methods of doing the taxidermy that really um, are modern methods. She's influenced what we see in museums today with the dioramas and the settings. Um, she discovered the subspecies with the ferrets. And then as I mentioned, she's she is recognized in the Hall of Fame. All right, we're gonna shift gears and turn to the grandmother of the conservation movement, Marty Murray. So how many of you are familiar with Marty Murray? Okay, we've got a few, I would expect that, okay. Um, she was born in 1902 when she's a child. I saw two different ages, so I'm not sure which one's correct. She moves to Fairbanks with her parents. Um, she is educated. She actually is the first woman to graduate what is now the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. And um, around that time, she meets and marries Olas Yuri. Um, he was born in 1889. And around the time they married, he's a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Bureau of Biological Survey, which is a predecessor agency of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, their honeymoon is a 500 mile, eight month research trip <laughs> in the wilds of Alaska, studying caribou, um, and, uh, so no, no, uh, all inclusive two weeks in the Caribbean. This was quite a honeymoon. Um, here's a picture of them on their honeymoon. Um, well, the one on the, uh, in the fur coats is, is posed afterwards, but I understand this one on the left is, is during the honeymoon. Um, later on, they have three kids and they travel some with the kids too. So I'm not doing Marty Murray justice. We're going to go really quickly through Marty. Um, they're doing exhaustive studies. They're putting together the research and science that's going to support a lot of um, work later on. She decides after the honeymoon and a few years of more research that she's just going to stick together. They, she's always going on his expeditions. She becomes quite uh, a natural history expert in her own right. And then um, let me move on here. So she starts campaigning for what is now the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. They do this together. Oles dies. Um, they had also been working on the Wilderness Act, protect wilderness, wilderness areas on public lands. Um, she wants to honor him and she continues doing the work. She does, she just goes on. This is the Murray Lodge or Murray Ranch, um, which became kind of a hub. She would invite people in, um, really had quite a community around her. I'm really freezing through Marty. Um, so she's a naturalist in her own right. She writes, she testifies to Congress, she speaks, she researches. This is one of her books, Two in the Far North, about that experience they had. Um, uh, I think we've covered that. Okay, a couple pictures. She's there for the signing of the Wilderness Act with President Johnson. And um, this is a little bit older picture of her. She lives to 101. Um, for the interest of time, I'm gonna keep going. Um, this is a famous quote of hers. Um, I'll give you a quick second to read it. I'm watching the time too. Okay, so we've talked about this. One thing I wanna point out here is you have Martha Maxwell, not very well known after a while. Marty Murray is a public figure. She's well recognized. See, I just wanted to point that out that you know she's out there in the world and um, you see that shift. 
All right, we're gonna shift the third time. So I had the first segment, Marty, and now we're gonna do a trio of women that I'm gonna connect together with DDT. So we have Rosalie, Lucille, and Rachel. So we'll start with Rosalie. Um, this is the separate, this is the socialite turned suffragist turned conservationist. Um, she was born in to wealthy parents. She is in the upper echelon of New York City um, in 1877. She marries in 1909. She's traveling. I put in Japan. She's always traveling. She goes to Europe. She, she was actually on a transatlantic uh, trip from Europe back to the United States when she met this very famous suffragist and learned about the, the movement and became a suffragist. And so she started learning um, different advocacy tactics. Um, one of the things that her biographer points out is that they were the first to pick at the White House. Nobody had done that. So um, she was picking up skills. Of course, the it wasn't too much later when the 19th Amendment um, gave white women the right to vote. Um, so she's kind of like, starts bird watching. She hadn't really been interested in birds before. Um, she notices that there's declining um, hawk and eagle populations. She founds this group called the Emergency Conservation Committee. And basically she works sometimes secretly with some of the top ornithologists of the day who are not willing to step out. She's the public face of, of um, trying to make some changes with the way conservation agencies are operating at the time. There are, there's bounty hunting, there's predator control programs. Um, she just railed against the National Audubon Society and the precursor of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Bi Biological Survey. She, um, her tactics, she published many, many pamphlets she sued, this was not done. She sued Audubon for their membership list because she wanted to tell them what they were doing. Um, she lobbied Congress, that wasn't really happening much before. Um, and she was buddy buddy with, she would communicate with the Secretary of the Interior. Um, and, and her biographer will say that, you know, some of those communications led to the change that led to the creation of the US Fish and Wildlife Service and some changes on how the agencies operate. Um, she's probably most known um, for creating Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in Pennsylvania. It's the world's first preserve for birds of prey. Um, she also learned early on, she was watching um, what was going on and alerting people to the effect of DDT on birds. Um, she did some other things, but we're gonna move on. Um, she died in 1962. This is a famous quote about her. The only honest, unselfish, indomitable Hellcat in the history of conservation. Her biography said she's the bridge between John Muir and Rachel Carson. Like she was known in her day. You did not mess with her. She was, she was a force of nature. Uh, this is a famous quote for the time to save a species. Well, it's still common. I mean, we were watching, they were, people were watching species disappear. Um, then it comes along Lucille Stickle. She was born in 1915. She's well-educated. She pauses while she's getting her PhD to get married. Um, Bill works at the uh, Patuxent Research Refuge. She's volunteering there and they wanna hire her, but she's thinking, well, let's save the job for the men's and the, and the, the, the soldiers come back from the war. But she eventually decides to take a job and she starts as a junior biologist. And then she completes her PhD in zoology. Her career advances at Patuxent. She publishes the first DDT contaminant paper in 1946. Um, she and the researchers she's working with published findings on DTT, DDT and egg thinning. Um, this was a really significant finding. Um, I'm not gonna really get into the details much about DDT and, and what they were doing, but this is significant. She's also the first female, the first woman to uh, lead a major national research lab. Um, and her work, it just shows here, you know, she hired, they, they, her, her staff published thousands of scientific papers and she passed away in 2007. Here's her with her husband. And then another picture of her. Um, before. So now we're gonna switch over to Rachel Carson. So I'm assuming a lot more of you know Rachel Carson than some of the women I've been talking about. Um, launched the modern environmental movement. 
So we're also going to breeze through Rachel Carson for the past. Um, she was born in 1907. Oh, I see. We were messing with the slides. It didn't, uh, you're seeing it cut off. Um, we hired her in 1936, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the, the predecessor, well, one of the predecessor, predecessor agencies, the Bureau of Fisheries hired her. Um, she was not the first professional woman um, to be hired by the agency, but she was one of the earliest ones. Um, I'm watching the time, so I'm not going to go much into Rachel Carson's life um, other than a couple things. She started writing when she was young. She started entering, she would submit articles for a, um, a, a literary magazine for children that had places where young people could write in. She was getting recognized. She would get a prize. She was so successful with one of them. They kept you know, wanting her to write for them. So early on, she was writing. And she also was in a family where she had no running water, very, very low means, but spent lots of time in nature and really developed a deep, deep, deep love of nature. This one? Yes. She, she lived uh, on the northwest bank of the Anacostia River near D.C. Silver Spring? Yes. She moved to a bunch of different places, but she lived there for... Right. But she moved to this beach in Chicago. Yes, she lived in Chicago. She lived in... She got a home in Maine that she lot. built. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I am so going to cut Rachel Carson's story so short because there's, so what I mostly wanted to do was um, she was writing, she was writing articles while she was employed um, as a federal employee. Um, her first book that she uh, published was Under the Sea Wind and it was well reviewed, but it wasn't bestseller material. Um, it was a little bit later when she published The Sea Around Us that got on the bestsellers list, they decided to republish the first book. And all of a sudden that's, that's up on the list too. She leaves her job with the federal agency and really devotes her life to writing. She is driven all through her life. She's usually financially supporting her family. Um, she ends up eventually adopting her grandnephew. Um, she, she lives with her mother most of her life until her mother passed. Um, she is driven and usually working to exhaustion. I mean, it's just amazing what she was, she was so driven and ambitious. Um, she, she spends a lot of time rewriting her work. So it takes a while to write these books. She's actually becoming ill at the end. I'm so went too far. Um, so just a couple more photos of her. Um, I will move on. This is with her with Bob Hines who illustrated, who was the illustrator for the book when she produced, um, Silent Spring. So let's connect back to Rosalie. So here she is at uh, Hawk Mountain um, in Pennsylvania. She is pulling, she's been starting to work on her research to, to publish Silent Spring and she's pulling from Patuxent's research. She's pulling all kinds of research. She's got a huge network. She's always running her writing um, by scientists. Her genius is her ability to be, to bring science and, and just this graceful, beautiful writing, eloquent writing together. And so um, we do know she has correspondence with Hawk Mountain. She's getting data from them. They're seeing declines. Um, so uh, some of the some of the work, I'm tying Rosalie back. And also she's relying on Lucille Stickles' work. Um, she publishes Silent, um, Silent Spring, which kicks off a fury of, of activity. Also, um, we start seeing a lot of environmental legislation. She just really kickstarted um, environmental history. She, she, or legislate, she, um, she's quite ill at the end of her life. She's testifying at Congress. She is being attacked by the chemical industries. They are trying to belitter her. They're trying to uh, discredit her science, but um, you may be familiar with it. So she passed away in 1964. DDT was banned. Um, I'm going to read this one. This is my favorite thing about my creatures. So this is the opening paragraph to Sense of Wonder. And I just think it's one of her, I just love this example of her writing. So one stormy autumn night when my nephew Roger was about 20 months old, I wrapped him in a blanket and carried him down to the beach in the rainy darkness. Out there, 
just at the edge of where we couldn't see, big waves were thundering in, dimly seen white shapes that boomed and shouted and threw great handfuls of froth at us. Together we laughed for pure joy. He, a baby meeting for the first time, the wild tumult of Oceanus, I with the salt of half a lifetime of sea love in me. Oh, I love it. All right. So, um, she was amazing. She connected with people who wouldn't read science otherwise, maybe, you know, she really brought a lot to the public. Um, so in the introduction that Sonia read, I talked about tea parties and I didn't cover those women because I changed my mind after I started doing this. So um, I want to leave time for questions. I'm going to, I'm going to get to the tea in a second. Um, just kind of take a minute to say, you know, who else is missing? Um, not, I mean, not just individuals. There's a lot of women, but everybody I shared was a white woman in the majority culture. You're not seeing me present others in this short piece. Um, other women who, who we're not recognizing. So we just keep asking the question, you know, whose stories are we not telling? So what I wanted to share is um, I have copies of the journal, at least about 40. So if folks want it. Um, if you want to learn more about these women, Maxwell is not in there, but the other women are and a bunch more. Um, you can also find the journal online. That link is there. It takes, you just Google U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Conservation History Journal, you'll find it. Um, the artwork that's on the cover, um, we had one of our, at NCTC, one of the graphic designers um, created these, um, the, the images on the cover and the front of each article about each woman, each essay has uh, uh, this artwork you've been seeing where she took a photo and then um, kind of made this design. Um, I just want to just, this is just kind of a quick sprinkle of some of the women that you're seeing visually in the, in the um, journal. And then I'm kind of curious if you'll play a quiz with me. Because <laughs> I'm kind of curious, because if you don't know some of these women, I'm trying to get you to read the journal so you can learn more about them. So um, does anybody want to try to see if you can figure out? Um, I have three pages of this. So um, does anybody want to at least shoot, shout out something you know? Yes, Marty Mary is A. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, all right, thank you. So what we've done is, um, let me go back. Marty Murie was A. Mamie Parker is B. Sylvia Earl is C. So we have Harriet Hemingway and Rosalie Edge. So Rosalie should be a giveaway. <laughs> Since we talked about Rosalie. So she's the suff suffragist. suffragist. Um, and now we get to the tea parties. Um, Harriet Hemingway, Hemingway M -N -way, and her cousin, Minnie Hall, Minna Hall, um, would invite women to tea parties. Um, this was in the era when everybody was using feathers in their hats and decimating uh, bird populations. And they would invite women to their parties and talk with them about this and convince them not to use feathers in their fashion. And so they were, they ended up becoming activists and really had a role um, in some of the legislation that eventually supported kind of what they were advocating for. Um, all right. You're not gonna probably know some of these, but will you, But anybody wanna take a guess at any of these? Celia Hunter, good deal. Pilot, ecotourism pioneer and conservation advocate who dedicated her life to preserving Alaska's environment. I'll help you out, but anybody else want to take? Um, Mr. Leonette for D. 
Yes, for D, Crystal and Eddie for D. <laughs> yes, that's fine. Yes. Okay, so the ones we have left are Helen Fenske, and I don't think we've done Florence Miriam Bailey. Helen is E, and no, did I do that right? Did I do that right? Crystal was D. Oh, I'm sorry, Lucille was C. Helen's E. I think we got everybody. Might have. B is um, Florence Miriam Bale. Look. They warned me to move. All right. Final quiz page. Um, there's actually an accidental repeat here, so you have a freebie. <laughs> Yes, yes, he is Rachel Carson. That's your giveaway, that's your freebie. The other one is we had Celia Hunter on the other page. I accidentally put her in there twice. So she's C. D, Molly Yes, first director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, first female director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Got Rachel Carson, E. Um, Francis Hammerstrom is B. And I think a fun one is, uh, Evelyn Spencer, fish evangelist, celebrity chef for the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries, promoted the con consumption of fish during World War I. You know, uh, during the wars, there was the Victory Gardens and try to not eat meat days. And so she, she was trying to get people to eat more fish. So this is actually a picture of Evelyn um, on one of her posters. She would do a cookbook that apparently is still being printed today. Um, trying to get people to eat fish that weren't maybe the most com common fish to eat, you know, ones that you maybe didn't normally want to eat. She would give you recipes to get you to do that. So, oh, that's my cheat sheet for anybody on, uh, if this if this lives online. And then um, we do have time for questions. We have a few minutes. So any any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Just a reminder to yeah. repeat the questions for the people on Zoom. Okay. And I will also see if we have any questions from our Zoom audience. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, what do you think it is that um, gave Marty more fame than Martha? Um, I think generally that she was a public figure. And in a time when, I mean, she, she got out there, whereas um, Martha lived in mostly rural places with less population. Um, she, she didn't have the financial means to stay afloat. Um, and I think when her collection died, I don't know, there was just nobody carrying the torch for her. Um, but I think later, just Marty was so much more of a public figure. And so, and she wrote to in the foreign, she, she wrote a more popular book. She, she, I think she published other books that were well-received. So she became more known in the populace. Yes. Um, well, yes. And if we wouldn't mind turning to our historian, Mark Madison, to answer that question. We oh, we didn't repeat the question. You're asking if NCTC, why does NCTC house the Rachel Carson collection? And yes, they do. So we do. You mentioned the Silver Springs. So we house her personal library, some of her correspondence, and uh, her letters, her graduation chapter, uh, high school, uh, some of that. Her main archives are up in um, Yale. And the reason we house it is we also house all the stuff she wrote for the 16 years she worked for us. So she worked for our agency longer than anything else she did in her life. And we have great items. You'll have to come out and visit someday. Maybe when we do a lanternfly lecture. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Oh, I saw another hand earlier. Yes. Put any truth in the story that uh, Mr. Audubon was really pushed by his wife, who uh, really was the one behind the whole rumor that became famous. I did not know that. Would you like to share any more about that? Mark? For the audience, this question was, um, uh, 
John Jane Audubon's wife, um, James Audubon's wife, what, what influence did she have on his career? Yeah. The, behind the scenes, you think she was, she was driving things. Okay. Yes, that's what happens. Yeah. Yeah, all of these women were trailblazers, pioneers, you know, they were discredited, they had to fight, they were, they, um, yeah, they laid the path, the, the role models for other women. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yes. You can still get to in the far north, you can still get, in fact, in the second way. I brought, I have as you can see Silent Spring with me. Um, I have, this is the newer book. I forgot to bring, I didn't bring the Marshall Maxwell book, but I have that. Um, there are, yeah, I mean, and so Ellen Murphy, who's going to watch this later, uh, we talked about how the Master Naturalists have a book club, and there could be, um, I'd be happy to follow up with folks. There were some books I came across in my research that I think are just, Fun books, amazing books. Um, yes. She's interesting because she they all fit in a house in the, in the island in the Bahamas. It was not the concrete block house. They filled it half full of water. And she lived with the dolphin, a feeder dolphin, for I think it was two months. And then totally they were together 24 7. Huh. Uh, and she did some interesting writing on dolphins herself. Okay. But she's not very well known. Right? She, yeah. It's interesting to me that she cohabitated with the feeder dolphin. So, yeah. Speaking of these women who aren't very well known, when I, I bought the book um, on the plains and the peaks, the, the Martha, the, the Mary Dart book about Martha Maxwell. And then after a while, I started getting online and I was pretty impressed. I found two um, living history women dressed up as, as Martha doing talks. And then I found this professor who um, got so interested, research, research, research. If, he, if there was a piece of her collection left, he was gonna find it. He found a chick. The Smithsonian. He ended up doing a, an exhibit and he created a green screen and tried to create some of the backdrops. So you get a picture as if you were in one of her, you know, settings and one of her dioramas. Um, she she's kind of been rediscovered. Um, she has a biography that was written by about her. Um, I'm going to say in the last 20 years, I don't really remember exactly when it was. I didn't read that one. Um, uh, so every once in a while, somebody gets discovered. Oh, I know there was a podcast I listened to. The dead women, the dead women's podcast. She's half a show. Max, Martha Maxwell is half a show on the dead women's podcast. And and while I was listening to one of the things I found, I about this book, Women in the Field, uh, America's Pioneering Women Naturalists. There's 25 women in here. I only recognize four of the names. So um, there's the scholarship and the research out there to find these women and to bring their work forward. But there's so many more. I mean, and there's, you can find, you know, National Wildlife Federation, other people keep lists and hall of fames of women. So there's so many women to talk about. So this was just a little snapshot of a few of them. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. Any, yeah. I have one question. Yeah. Do you need so, this? Here. Maria's, I sent Maria's journal to my uncle. And um, the person she didn't talk about tonight, Fran Hammerstrom was a pioneer. She was the first woman taught by Ella Leopold. She was the first woman to really be a raptor biologist, just brilliant. And uh, my uncle worked for the DNR in Wisconsin. He's like, oh, I studied under Fran Hammerstrom. And I was like, oh, that's that's amazing. I mean, he's 90. I said, well, what was she like? And he's like, oh, she was really a great ornithologist. And then she'd take all the students to her cabin in Northern Wisconsin to make breakfast for her. But he said it was the dirtiest kitchen he's ever seen. He said <laughs> she had all these birds, these rescue birds <laughs> all over. And they'd fly over the eggs and there'd be feathers in it. And she'd just pluck them out. <laughs> she was really dedicated to the raptors. And, uh, so the journal is great. I really recommend you pick it up. Yeah, And I have copies of the journal for everybody here tonight, um, or hopefully um, up at the end here. 
Uh, I know you have an alarm going off, so I don't know if you have any closing. Oh, that, oh, that, oh I thought they're like, your time's up. Eight o'clock. Um, oh, one more question. Yes. <laughs> Paparazzi is here. Um, I wrote my master's thesis on three women who were unknown heroes in the conservation movement, and two of them were Rosalie Edge and Marty Murray. And I went to the Murray Ranch, which is where her, her archives are, and she was still alive at that time. And so I got to meet her and she was in her, she had some, some uh, memory issues, but I got to spend an evening with her. And I told her that I was, uh, I don't know if we were engaged at that point or dating or whatever, uh, a wildlife biologist fan. And, uh, and she said, watch out for the skulls. <laughs> and I said, excuse me. She's like, watch out for the skulls. And I, her person, her companion said to me, you know, uh, Olus was constantly bringing animals home and putting them on the stove and boiling them down <laughs> to get the skulls. And uh, and it's true, there have been those kind of things yeah. in our house. So. Thank you. Well, I think it's a really fun topic. Um, there's so many great women to learn about and people in conservation. Do you? Are we good? Okay. Do you need to do any closeout or anything? Uh, well, just thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. This is so great. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, so thank you all. Thank you. Um, and just a brief blurb about the end. Um, if you're here today or you're joining us, please consider supporting CJS. Uh, we have many free programs, many low-cost programs, and a lot of that is due to the generosity of donors, um, which could be you. And I also want to point out, actually, Ellen's not here. I was going to point out, Ellen, uh, to talk a little bit about auction items, but we are still taking them. Um, and if you have anything that you think might be good for an auction, it doesn't have to be anything super fancy, but something that people would want in nice condition, please talk to Kristen. And just an example, Peggy Bowers is here, and she last year donated a bird-friendly gardening consult, and she has said she would do that again next year. So just as an example of a fantastic item that you could bid on, or if you have other items to donate, we could talk about that. And Marianne brought some of the books that she's contributed to, and I think it's even signed. So we have lots of wonderful items that you can bid on, but we are definitely still collecting items. So if you know somebody who has a skill or something they'd be willing to donate, or if you yourself are cleaning out your closet and think, oh, this would be perfect, talk to me or to Ellen Kinzer, who was here earlier this evening. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody wants um <laughs> Thank you.